Dr. Green Thumb. Paging Dr. Green Thumb. Canada is in many ways has been leading uh, the global marketplace in cannabis, both in their own country and exporting to other countries. Uh, they will soon be legalizing for all adults cannabis commerce across uh, the nation. And I'm going to introduce the moderator who will handle the rest of the panel. Uh, she's really uh, an all around rock star pioneer in the British Columbia cannabis scene. Uh, she's the director for government relations for MMJ Canada. She is the director of BC Independent Cannabis Alliance and a partner with Groundworks Consulting. Please give a warm welcome for Ms. Jamie Shaw. Can't go without attention. Hello, my name is Dr. Green Thumb. Hello, my name is Dr. Green Thumb. Uh, Hello, my name is Dr. So our panel is called Greening the North, and uh, obviously we're going to be talking about a lot of Canadian-specific details, uh, but our goal is to kind of give you an overview of, of what it looks like when an industrialized nation legalizes cannabis, um, some of the different things that happen. We, we've got an amazingly diverse panel here right now that represents a wide variety of stakeholders within the industry. Um, first, we have uh, Clinton Young. Clint is CEO of MMJ Canada, uh, which has eight stores and growing across Canada. Uh, we've got licenses in two different municipalities right now. Uh, Clint works closely with the Lost organization. Uh, it's a mental health division that reflects Clint's main focus with cannabis. Um, it's called uh, Living Outside uh, Suffering Trauma. Um, and it provides services to uh, homeless or, or the underhomed um, that need some, su some support because they're also suffering from mental illnesses. So please welcome Clint Young. Next up, we have Nick Pateras. He's the Vice President, Growth of Lyft Company Limited, uh, Canada's leading cannabis media technology and product platform. Um, I would also point out it's, it's uh, pretty much the only cannabis industry-specific uh, media, um, rather than just cannabis news. Uh, with a mission to empower informed cannabis decisions, Lyft collects and disseminates big data with the goal of bridging informational gaps between buyers and sellers. So please welcome Nick Pateras. Next up is Robert Loy. Loy, he's an international uh, lawyer, writer, and speaker, qualified qualified as a solicitor in both England and in Canada. Um, he was uh, Robert's also the chairman advisory board. That's actually changed, aren't you? Actually, a director of Liberty Leaf. No, no, chairman of chairman the of the advisory board. All right, um, it's a Canadian-based public company, which also is uh, Will Raskin. Uh, he comes to Liberty Leaf with 25 years experience in the investment brokerage industry, most recently as a partner, uh, senior investment advisor with Northern Securities. Um, so just before we kind of get into this, I'm going to give a, a very brief uh, <laughs> and very uh, condensed version of how Canada actually sort of got to where we are right now. Uh, in 1969, the then Liberal government decided that it wanted to do a study on illegal drugs and on cannabis. It was called the Ladin Commission. It took them three years. Uh, when they came back, they actually recommended that cannabis be legalized. Um, nothing was actually done about that at all uh, for quite a few years. Uh, before there was any more kind of government movement on this, there were battles in the courts, lots of battles in the courts. and so courts had decided that patients had right to access, that they had right to have someone else grow for them, that that person could grow for more than one person, then more than two persons. Um, it was actually just a constant fight for about 20 years. While that was going on, dispensaries sort of exploded as, as a gray market option. Um, some of them are actually now licensed in Vancouver. Um, in 2014-2015, uh, when the ACM par ACMPR was launched, uh, at that point we had the first sort of fully functioning legal medical system. Unfortunately, it still didn't work for everybody in the country, particularly those that were already being serviced by dispensaries that had a wider variety of product that they were allowed to carry, um, were allowed to talk about the product more than, than the licensed producers were. Um, and then in 2015, we got um, court cases again, decided we're going to have edibles at some point and other forms of cannabis. We do have a, a, an oil that was introduced legally following that court decision, but that's all we've actually seen on that at this point. Um, and we've put medical on hold. We, we, you know, in 2015, we elected the first uh, political party to really run on a platform of full legalization. They won. 
um, and we've been sort of waiting to see what's going to happen with that first. They've been very clear, we're not talking about medical, we're not going to adjust it or do anything, it's just going to stay in place, we'll look at it later after we've got some data back from legalization. We know we're going to have edibles, um, but they're not even going to start talking about that uh, for another year, um, so we know that that's coming eventually. Uh, the government's been making some huge strides in terms of um, easing some of the burdens on the large licenses, creating classes for smaller licenses, including microproducer, microprocessor, um, and some nursery licenses. So we're seeing a lot of movement, but we haven't seen any sort of applications yet for that. Um, and provinces are starting to roll out their retail models, where in the east, they're mostly going to be controlled by government stores, and in the west, they're mostly <laughs> going to be private retail, mostly still have to buy from the government in between. Um, so with that sort of as a context of where we are overall in Canada, uh, Clint, where are you and MMJ exactly at within all of that? Um, it's, it's a little bit complex for us because uh, we are a Canada-wide based dispensary, um, which meaning each province sets its own regulations and uh, as Jamie said, uh, Ontario where we're very strong based out of, um, uh, we're having issues with the government. They want to have full control over all distribution and all levels of cannabis. Um, I'm working hard right now with municipalities and uh, lobbying provincial government uh, because of the election coming up uh, to have us carved in either a medicinal and or recreational component. I'm not quite sure yet how it will look. Um, for MMJ Canada on the West Coast, uh, we have two licenses. Uh, and one in a variance with the city. So uh, for us, it's, it's, we have to be very patient. Uh, I said this last year when I was here, we had to be very patient, and a year later I still have to be very patient. So um, it's getting closer to legalization. Um, it's getting closer to us figuring out which path we're gonna be going. Um, we are trying to vertically integrate our company on many other levels, um, but as of right now, uh, we have to let the, the government kind of unroll platforms and we need to kind of make our next move a very strategic one because it could make or break us, so. Yeah. Um, is this one? Nope. That one's not working. No. Yeah, okay. Go, go, go. Nope. Um, Nick, so you guys just announced that you're going public, which is kind of big news because that hasn't been on the horizon for most people. That's right. Um, what, what has been going on for, for you guys? Where do you fit within all of this? And, and yeah. yeah, so we play a role um, in bridging the informational gap between buyer and seller. Um, so essentially we're Canada's largest cannabis uh, media and tech company, whether that's through our events, our um, educational content, or our data solutions and training services. So essentially the need uh, that we've identified and the role we play is, as I mentioned, closing the informational gap um, or the informational asymmetry between buyer and seller. And so where there's been extremely tight advertising restrictions and promotional tactics, um, that have been prohibited by uh, the government. In the past, we try to do the best to inform and empower patients to make informed cannabis decisions. Um, that was true in today's market, in the medical world. It'll be even more true in uh, the adult use world. And so um, our role becomes important because we know that there's a lot of consumers who will come online for the first time, or consumers who um, have been buying the category for a number of years, but just un unfamiliar with what a legal market looks like. And so the idea is to um, cultivate and disseminate the information to help people make those decisions. Nice, thank you. Uh, and Rob, you know, you and I are kind of all over the place with this stuff. Uh, we, we've got our fingers in a bunch of different pies. Um, but overall, how's Ad Lusum, wh where is it positioned within this whole framework? Well, um, I'm in a very unique position because I grew up in the black market, but I also have a law degree from Oxford University, and I used to work in capital markets in the city of London and on Wall Street. Actually, one of the firms I used to work at was the CIA's law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell on Wall Street. So when I was done with that work and went back to Vancouver, my hometown, I set up shop with my own law practice. Well, because, again, I was known in the industry, and had training, education, and experience that is certainly of value to any emerging industry, let alone the cannabis space, I've been very busy. Um, and so with that, we've seen a tremendous amount of change from a few people with pot to now everybody involved with pot or cannabis. And uh, 
the proud the pride for me is that legalization in Canada has been driven by a court process it's actually the people who've taken the federal government to court and we have in Canada what's called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and under the Charter we have section 7 which is life liberty and security of the person and so it's basically through that fundamental right that the cannabis program in Canada legally has started going back as far as 2002. Rushing fast forward to today, what we're seeing, and again why it's exciting and frustrating for me at the same time, is we're seeing lots of interesting endeavors and enterprise in cannabis. However, those who have been the pioneers of the market, those who have been the ones who've gone to jail for the right to grow cannabis or to produce medicine are not necessarily allowed to participate in this new market. In fact, Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, love him or hate him, I have mixed feelings about him personally, but <laughs> he, his agenda with legalization is threefold, right? One is to make our streets and communities safer, okay? That's and a good idea. Remove the black market and keep and make it safe for children. All of those are noble endeavors, but the execution of them, when you actually get behind and look at how cannabis is being legally regulated in Canada, it's rather suspect that those goals and endeavors will happen. So really to sum up here, I'm seeing a lot. If this marijuana industry was like a roulette game, I see red and black, legal, illegal. The difficulty, however, is until we know what the actual rules and the regulations look like, anyone out there who's an entrepreneur is not going to know where they're to put their chips on red or black or what number and then to leverage to get an investment. So I'm confident and I'm also excited that as we do see the rules and regulations in Canada begin to normalize and level out, we're going to see even greater entrepreneurship. But at the same time, I also want to see greater inclusion from the original OG pioneers, if you will, who got us this far. And so with that, um, in, either, in, in, in either way you look at it, Canada is a very exciting market. So glad that we're here. Yeah, and you bring up a very important point. I mean, one of the weird things to me about this whole legalization thing is that there's, they're, it's, you, they're using the same tools that they used in prohibition. So um, there's still some lessons, I think, to be learned. Um, Will, where, where do you and your company all fit within this, this what's been going on in Canada? And, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm thankful that Rob is uh, the chairman of our advisory board because I just let him do all the talking. So, <laughs> But you know, with that said, I, I can speak from... The perspective of a, a publicly listed company in Canada, um, we went through the transition um, a couple of years ago, like many um, cannabis startups, we went from the mining industry, which was depressed, to going through the whole change of business scenario uh, and becoming a, a listed public company in the cannabis sector. And, and through that process, um, you know, we've been able to um, acquire two late stage applicants under the ACMPR program, uh, which, which is the path one needs to take to, to have uh, a license to, to grant you the, the opportunity to cultivate and sale, sell product in the medicinal space right now. But, um, you know, the opportunity I see for Canadian publicly traded companies is we're really at the tip of the spear when it comes to raising capital and deploying that capital internationally. So specific to Liberty Leaf, you know, we're listed in Canada on the CSC, we're listed in the OTCQB in the States, and we're listed here in Frankfurt, or in Frankfurt in Germany. And so the reason I wanted to come to this conference was to learn more about the aptitude for the, the, the German cannabis investor. and. Um, you know, from what I can see today, there, there's a lot of interest in cannabis, in investing. And um, so the, 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 where we fit in the mix here is, 
you know, we're able to raise capital, deploy capital internationally. I, I do feel that the Canadian sector, per se, is getting a little saturated when it comes to um, licenses and, uh, and, and what have you. So the opportunity we have, again, having the platform of being able to raise capital is to deploy that, uh, whether it's in Germany or Greece or Malta or y you name it, whatever the countries are, are bringing medicinal uh, legislation to the table, we want to be, we want to be there. Thank you. Uh, also, just want to apologize. I shouldn't have sat next to Clint. It's like if we went to high school together, we'd have been the kids in the back of the class, just joking, <laughs> getting kicked out every day. Um, one of the big things for me that was the biggest surprise in the, in the legalization process was the inclusion of, of the different classes of licenses that kind of came out of nowhere. Um, that was a big step as, as you know, an advocate lobbyist that took about five years off my career. Um, so I was kind of surprised to see that happen so quickly. Uh, what were some of the biggest surprises for you, Clint? Um, well, the, the biggest surprise was uh, the fact that everybody's surprised that the government is uh, leaving it up to the provinces. The fact that everyone in my industry seems to be shocked that the government is going about it the way it is, when in reality, no one should be shocked. Um, they've always wanted to have a, a strong control, which is understandable. They've, they've always kind of done things uh, the way they want. And I think in my industry, you need to be prepared for anything that the government's going to do. If you're, if you're only one dimensional, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. I think you need to be able to uh, have your fingers in all pots in all aspects of the industry so you can prepare for the worst uh, and or the best, uh, depending on how it goes. Um, you know, the government has, has made it clear that they're going to leave it up to each province. Um, you know, in no surprise to me, you know, uh, that it's, it's, each province is going about it drastically differently. Um, I, I guess I was surprised a little bit that there wasn't any inclusion of a dispensary model in Ontario at all, like really no, no even talk about it, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, but it seems like now with the new election, there might be some hope for that. So we'll, again, have to be patient and wait and see. Um, so for myself, I think um, what I was maybe not surprised about, but perhaps I would like to see the government show more movement on is the uh, treatment of medical cannabis is distinct from adult use cannabis. Um, the regulations right now are very focused on the recreational market. I mean, it has been a sprint um, since the government announced the bill uh, on April 13th of last year. But with every iteration of regulations uh, that are released, we continue to see that there actually isn't uh, a, a robust enough distinction between the medical market and the uh, non-medical market. So by way of example, medical cannabis in Canada is still taxed, unlike any other prescription uh, medication. Um, they're also proposing an excise tax on certain medical products um, once the bill comes into play in the fall. Um, the packaging regulations that were released a couple months ago um, it dictates that packaging for medical cannabis must be the same as uh, non-medical. What it actually looks like is completely plain packaging with a list of health warnings and a massive red stop sign that says warning THC. So if you're a patient and you're looking to medicate, and this is a medicine that actually unlocks for you uh, a day's worth of functioning fully, uh, where previous uh, forms of treatment were um, not uh, effective for you, and you receive your medicine like that, it's not, uh, not the type, type of patients, not the type of healthcare we like to deliver in Canada. And yet that is the reality we're facing now. And so I'd like to see more of a distinction between the medical and the adult use markets. And um, though there is a, a lot of noise around the recreational side of things, and rightly so, it is a massive market and a massive opportunity. Um, we mustn't forget the patients who got us to where we are today, those who fought in the courts, who have advocated for decades, um, and ensure that their access to their medicine is not limited. And we're uh, potentially have that in jeopardy if we don't take the right steps now. Yeah, and that's been one of the, the concerning things about the Liberal platform. You know, they first came out with it in 2013, um, way before they were in power, and, and they just never looked at medical. There was never anything medical. It's a little frustrating. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, I think that we, we recognize there's only a small percentage of, of uh, people who actually go through the legal medical channels. So right now, 19% of uh, consumers who report that they use cannabis primarily for medical purposes go through the legal channels. That 
is a, a, you know, a comment on access, it's a comment on price, um, it's a comment on a lot of things actually. We need to do more convenience, uh, we need to do more to ensure that patients are treated as patients, distinct from a recreational consumer. Well, and, and the really interesting thing is, is a large part of that percentage that you just mentioned are new patients that ACMPR actually opened up access to, people in rural areas that didn't have access before. So it was basically a new market that kind of came in Hopefully. and opened up. Yep. Uh, Rob, what was the biggest surprise for you about liberal legalization? Well, um, yes, actually, I have Jamie Shaw to thank for um, the biggest surprise. I mean, when Clint rightly hit on that when it comes to government, money, and control, there aren't surprises. That's their two MOs. But the biggest surprise that Jamie informed me about was when we started looking at the new ACMPR. Or no, excuse me, the Bill C-45 Cannabis Act. Now, I know the Germans like a good scary story, the Brothers Grimm, right? Uh, here's something pretty grim. So when you read the definition of cannabis, and then you go to the cross-reference Schedule 1, and in Schedule 1, the definition, and this is the scary part, says that the definition of cannabis includes all phytocannabinoids derived from cannabis and non-cannabis derived sources. Or similar to. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. similar to. So basically, let me boil that down, why I find that so scary and unforgivable, is it's not the government's job to say, if you don't get your phytocannabinoids from us, you're going to jail. Yeah. That's a slippery slope from, if you don't get your water from us, you're going to jail. You don't get your food from us, or if your food is not prepared in the way that we say so, you're going to jail. So ultimately, the scariest thing about Bill C-45 is the degree of control by which if you're doing anything outside the circle, we'll call it the sacred circle of legality, if you do anything outside that, or produce phytocannabinoids, the same phytocannabinoids that you can get from kale and echinacea, you technically can get from cannabis. So, I mean, is anyone else not alarmed about that? It's, it's, again, and if these laws are not challenged, the scary thing is this gives government an unfettered control over essential aspects of human life. And I see cannabis being one more step to where governments will be able to try to control plant life, organic material, which, again, next thing you know, will be cloning. So. That's the scary thing, is that people see this as just, oh, it's cannabis, it's a medicine, it's a weed, tax it, move on. Ultimately, I think, is a fundamental human freedom around access to a substance that we all need for survival, but for the last 93 years have been denied by the government. So, yes, I find that quite surprising and scary. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Will, what, what's kind of been the biggest surprise for you in this process? Well, you know, not so much surprising. It's, I think uh, from our perspective as a pub co, we just have to adapt and be nimble in, in our sort of approach to cannabis. So um, a good example would be the, the recent advent of the microcultivator status. And um, the, it just sort of dovetailed quite nicely with our distribution sales only license that we're um, on uh, we've, we've got a late stage application through the Health Canada ACMPR process but w w what that means is the micro cultivators are the uh, the smaller MMAR growers that um, the the government wants to basically roll into the the, the program here and um, so the advent of that level of licensing will allow those individuals to continue to grow but they, they cannot sell direct to the public. So specific to Liberty Leaf with our distribution only license, uh, those micro cultivators will be, a, we'd be a partnership with those growers. And so uh, again, and, and then we would take that product and, and take to the two dir directly to the market, to the retail consumer. So not so much surprising on our end, it's just all about adapting with you know, the ever-changing rules and goalposts that, um, that come our way. 
Nice. Um, I, I think another good surprise, as well as the licenses, was uh, the changes to hemp regulations. That was another kind of unexpected thing that came in. Um, our, our old hemp regulations were ridiculous. Uh, you could basically grow the hemp and then had to destroy the rest of the plant. You weren't allowed to extract any CBD or use the roots or do anything else with it. And that's, that's eased up a lot. So I think that was another kind of nice surprise. Um, other than, you know, the, the space that we're in is, is very rapidly evolving and changing uh, all the time. Um, other than some of those, what, what have been sort of the specific issues or challenges that, that you have uh, with your company and how it's positioned and how regulations are coming? Um, one of the major challenges we've had with MMJ Canada is that uh, each province is drastically different per regulation. So you get comfortable with a way you're doing something in the industry, uh, for example, in Vancouver, um, and then they announce a regulation in Alberta, and you're filing and doing an application that's something completely out of your realm and, and not what you're used to doing. Um, the, the fear of the unknown of where I'm gonna get my supply in the future, uh, how many licenses I'm gonna have, uh, is, is not concerning, but you know, it, it, it's definitely something I think about on a, on a daily basis. Um, so where I see myself in, in the space is, is that we gotta be very uh, vigilant on, on how we approach each province. Uh, I think we need to do a lot of education uh, on each province. Um, Jamie also works for MMJ Canada as a government relations director, so having her on my team uh, has really eased up a, a lot of the things and, and the processes for each province because she uh, is an educator and, and she investigates into each province on how they operate, so uh, that's made my life a lot easier. Um, but moving forward, um, I think it's gonna be key on who you partner with, uh, key on your standard, key on your product testing, and I think uh, if you cross all your T's and dot your I's, you have a good chance of longevity in the cannabis space, as long as you're willing to adapt. So. Uh, thanks, yeah, and we talked a little bit about one of the things that you're doing, but uh, what have been some of the challenges that you're seeing coming? Um, I think where we position ourselves at the center of education and um, introducing and welcoming new people into the into the market, uh, whether that is um, regulated consumers or non-consumers um, or business people, it's just ensuring that we're deconstructing that stigma. That still it still remains uh, a problem, probably not in a room like this, um, but the reality is that a lot of people uh, still continue to harbor a demonization of the plant, and so where we have to work extra hard is to deconstruct construct that pone, uh, pothead stoner archetype that really doesn't resemble anything but the unwanted poster child. And so uh, for us, where we have you know, 250 odd thousand medical patients through the legal channels now, and we'll have five to maybe up to eight million consumers come online um, as a result of legalization. A lot of these people have no idea how cannabis interacts with the body. They have no idea what the different molecular compounds are, um, the difference between you know THC and CBD and, and all of the other ones. I mean, it's it's a fun opportunity to be able to educate them when you can speak about some of the, uh, the details that people may not be familiar with, for example, um, I love talking about uh, the, the myth that cannabis necessarily induces the munchies. If you talk about uh, a cannabinoid like THCV, tetrahydrocannabivirin, it's a very effective um, appetite suppressant and so can be used in weight loss routines. These are the kinds of conversations that had people take a step back where they thought they already knew something um, and you're really helping them, uh, you know, swim across that lake of, uh, of misinformation. And so to your, to your question, the biggest challenge we have is, is education uh, because people are coming from a place of, uh, at best, ignorance, at worst, opposition because of the result of 95 years of prohibition. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, the, the previous speaker also referred to one of the things around this is that we, we don't actually know that much about cannabis. Uh, for as long as we've been using it within our new scientific system, we don't really know. And most of the research that we're doing isn't really telling us anything because we don't know what cannabinoid profile was tested, how many, what the terpene levels were. Uh, it would be a very simple fix to just, you know, if you're going to do research, maybe find out what it is first. But uh, yeah. And that's, I think, a responsibility of the, the industry 
industry needs to take on, where the result of almost a decade of prohibition in Canada at least results in you know two different extremes, where you have one extreme of people making therapeutic and medical claims about the plant that aren't backed by clinical late stage clinical studies. Um, you also have one the other end of the extreme where people are convinced that cannabis consumption leads to rape, violence, murder, and so on. And realistically, we know neither of those are really supported by science. The truth, like most things, lives somewhere in the middle. And so that's where we aim to insert ourselves. So it's our responsibility to be very particular with our words and um, and admit where we don't have all the facts and where we're doing more to learn um, more about them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Rob, what do you what do you see coming in terms of issues? What are and, and you know specific to the work that you do? Well, I see more of the same, really. Um, I've made a career of essentially being a bit of a thorn in the side of government, if you will, in a good way. Um, I've also well been known I've helped government. I've recently been appointed to a municipal cannabis task force. And I guess what it comes all down to is, like my colleagues have said, is there's education and there's standing up for instances involving cannabis where you see an, an injustice happening. Ignorance, or you see people being put down because of their cannabis use, or folks making false assumptions due to cannabis. I mean, really, it's your job as a conscientious cannabis user and supporter to step up in those 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 situations. We're going to see certainly a lot more I was close. I'm in the well, quadrant. I look at it this way. There's the folks that are getting licensed and, and so on, and I'm happy to represent a number of those clients, but I also represent probably the 95% who are getting screwed by Health Canada. So there's going to be no shortage of work there. That will continue, unfortunately, and until we as Nick pointed out, we have and we see the, from the government a little bit more clarity in the direction upon which they're going to take things. Uh, it'll be very, it'll just, I think, continue to be a little bit of more of the same in that regard. That change will continue to come through the courts. Um, government will continue to do what it will do in its best interest. And citizens, of course, have the obligation to engage in legal methods of changing the law, but at the same time, the success that we've achieved with cannabis, at least in Canada, has come through you know, decades of civil disobedience. And I think we're going to see more of that too. So it's an exciting time for a lawyer. I mean, I really look at it with my law firm being you know, Ad Lucem Law Corporation, it's my ship, and I'm sailing right into a perfect storm, which is exciting, but if I hadn't been doing what I've been doing for like the last two decades of my practice, I wouldn't be ready for these changes, and I believe I am ready for these changes because I've done what's been necessary every day to prepare for these. Yeah, well, and B, B, Bill C-45, sister bill, uh, C-46, C46 is going to keep you pretty busy, too, because it's not that impaired driving rates are going to go up, but charges certainly are. No, the uh, noose will be tightened around everybody's neck, which is why it's imperative that you understand these laws and how they affect you, because I think you're going to realize that cannabis regulation is going to pervade so many aspects of human rights, civil society and and what we consider normal tenants of being being a community those will all be challenged yeah i mean we've already seen that with medical patients that have won the right to grow but if they're renting from somebody uh, the landlord doesn't have to let them grow on their property so really it's only if you have a house that you can actually grow if you have need medicine uh will what's what's coming for you guys in terms of issues or challenges I think for the, the PubCo perspective, um, the challenge for us is just to stay focused. There's so many opportunities to, to invest in the cannabis sector. And uh, whether it's in, you know, in our own backyard in, in, in Canada and, and going through the, the typical ACMPR process and getting licensed, because at the end of the day, that's your ticket to participating in, in the business to you know internationally the opportunities internationally or is, it could it be in in, in science and in r d is it in cbd pet products which we're involved with with a partnership in israel there's so many opportunities that that were shown 
uh, that the the challenge for me as as a CEO is just to stay focused and um, but but that's that's a good problem to have because we we get we have a lot of opportunities that we we vet and um, and thankfully we have the the capital that if we do see an opportunity that we like and 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 fits the bill then then we can react so that that's probably the, uh, a good challenge and if that. Um, really quickly, just to touch up on <clears throat> kind of what all of us have been speaking about, um, it seems like Canada is going through, like Rob said at one point, a pretty grim transition. It, it's really not so bad. From all the challenges that you hear us going through, all the, the ups and downs, um, it's, it's quite a blessing to be a part of this. You know, the fact that uh, I, I'm, I'm working with somebody like Nick, who's a part of the media company, it's, it's not on the dispensing side. The fact that I'm friends with somebody like Will, who is essentially a, a competition, he's a, a, a licensed producer, which is awesome. The fact is that we're all up here, and when you find good people in the industry, you learn to work with each other, and you start putting your heads together, and you start doing some pretty impressive things. So I just don't want Germany to think that what we're going through is all trials and tribulations. It's it's a pretty awesome experience. Actually, let me qualify on that. It is pretty awesome, and let me make it clear. We are transitioning from a time where people aren't necessarily going to jail anymore for roaches or joints or you know, for, for inconsequential issues regarding cannabis. So I think we've turned a real page there where now we're going to see instead of, you know, the traditional arrests for possession and trafficking, we're going to see more sophisticated issues involving cannabis, such as proceeds of crime, money laundering, um, and, and probably still the same old usual suspects of trafficking and possession, but the circumstances by which people will actually go to jail and where families will be torn apart and where children will be taken from their parents in, in ministry cases. I'm happy to say that that's the end of Act One. And, and as what Clint said and with Nick and what we're all involved in, we're all very fortunate to be part of what's coming Act Two legalization. It's not perfect, but you know, it, that's why I'm proud to be Canadian. I'm proud to be here. I'm proud that we're the first G7 country may not necessarily be proud about how we're going about it, but I'm proud to be here and proud to be part of this group. Yeah. But there are always you know, mistakes made any time a country does something for the first time. And so you know, we're, we're obviously so proud to be here and to be representing Canada. At the same time, we recognize that there are differences the government, uh, different approaches the government could have taken or different tactics. The general theme is one of optimism. And, um, and support. We just think there are certain things, obviously, that can be put over time. We, the government and you know, all the businesses involved in the space will learn from themselves. And you know, 5, 10, 15 years down the line, um, you know, hopefully we'll have ironed out some of those kinks. Precisely. Yeah, and, and after talking to government officials for a long time and having them just say, well, I can't do anything about your patients. Sorry, it's not legal. Um, it, that, that is the biggest thing. When, once it becomes a law, there's now a process to change it, just like any other law. And yeah. so while it's not going to be perfect and it's probably going to be pretty rough for the first couple of years, um, there's ways to Grim. fix it and improve it now. And yeah. so that's we have to We have to recognize it, that legalization, uh, though it may often be purported as uh, an event in the media, is actually not. It's a process and therefore it's iterative. And so we see the changes over time. It's an evolution. Um, it's not it's a we, marathon, not a sprint. And, exactly. and we're certainly not done. I mean, what we're seeing in Canada is a lot of people just kind of went, oh, well, the federal government's doing it now and forgot about the provinces and how much power they were going to have for a little while. Uh, and they forgot about their cities. So there's cities that are saying, you know what, we don't want to be part of legalization. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done on, on every single level there. Um, and we, and we kind of can't be negligent on that. And, and you know, the other area is is that what we've seen in Canada is what we've seen in Washington State and what we've seen in Colorado. Um, the injustices built into prohibition don't actually go away with legalization. You actually have to provide incentives to make things better for those communities that have been paying a higher cost for this all along. Um, I think we're close to... We're very close, yes. We have uh, maybe five minutes left. Perfect. Let's hear it for the panel one time. Oh, is that for no Q&A? I'm confused. Does anyone have any questions have for them? Questions for Kevin. Over here, all the way over questions there. All right, I'm coming. I tried to guess that it would, they would be on this side, but apparently <laughs> I, I was close. I'm in the front quadrant. But uh, here we go. Sorry, we didn't get to the last question. As Hippocrates put it, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. 
cannabis is most definitely a medicinal food. So governments often controlled by divide and rule. A drug is etymology, etymologically a, a, a dried food from the Dutch drogue. So my question is, as we all have an endocannabinoid system, surely all cannabis use is medicinal. Hmm. Well, a direct statement. Is that a question? So, I mean... Oh, surely! Oh, I yes. mean, is medicinal? You, and, uh, the, 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 the argument obviously can be made, I mean, insofar as you have an endocannabinoid system with which all cannabinoids can interact, whether that's phyto or endogenous uh, cannabinoids. Um, you have a central nervous system that interacts with any substance as well. I mean, the way I see it more is the use case in the eyes of the consumer. So to the extent that I have friends who purely enjoy the recreational and social properties of cannabis, I would actually label them a recreational consumer, not a medical patient. Even though it's uh, therapeutic. Of course, of course. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so the, it's in the eyes, in my mind, in the eyes of the consumer. But you make a good point that, yes, we have an endocannabinoid system, which is kind of why the plant is, uh, has such a beautiful harmony with our bodies. Well, and I think the whole issue is one of taxation. Uh, despite the fact that we've had legal cannabis for a long time and the courts have consistently said you have to provide medical patients with access to cannabis, they've not called it a medicine, which is why they've been able to put these taxes on it. So it, it is kind of a false definition that's born of prohibition. We, you know, Dispensaries and early activists were trying to target those that needed it desperately, not who just made people's lives better. Right? And, and, and so that's why we've ended up with this sort of weird definition. To answer your question, though, the reason, I, I, and it's very important, thank you for bringing endocannabinoid and the fact that, you know, regardless, Dr. Gabor Mate would, would agree, I think, with, with your conclusion of cannabis being medicine due to the fact we have an endocannabinoid system and regardless of how it's, it's rec or med, regardless. But you have to remember that out of the legal process, so again, in California, which set the stage for a lot of what's gone on in Canada. Proposition, forget the number, but again, it was, it was, just, 96. was medical. 96 and Proposition 215. 215, so. You have about 45 more seconds, Rob, good luck. <laughs> With that, um, I'm just gonna turn over to Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, we'll, we'll all be around. You're going to get a lot more Canadian panels coming up. So our goal was, again, to kind of just give an overview of, of what kind of things you can expect, where, where you're going to get sudden opposition from senators or from certain towns and uh, things like that. So I hope you guys have a great conference. One more time for the panelists here for Jamie and Clint.